So the topic is called Deferred Memory Block Initialization um, for boot time reduction. So in the agenda, uh, I'll talk a bit more about um, me and the team, uh, what we work on and what we are uh, in Qualcomm. And I'll talk a few functions related to memory, uh, system memory initialization like uh, uh, paging init, boot mem init, and then mm init. And we'll talk about the, uh, the deferred memory initialization. Um, and then ways to limit the, the boot memory. Uh, and then what is the, the boot time reduction KPI numbers, like what, what are the performance numbers. And then the challenges and the lim limitations uh, uh, with this future. So um, I work in the, in the Linux kernel team. Uh, so we majorly uh, do uh, memory management, scheduler, DCVS, uh, you know, board bring-ups. Uh, we are like the core kernel uh, for most of the kernel uh, features that we do. Uh, you know, for our, our Android OEMs. And um, my work is majorly in the memory management side, uh, but I also have interest in firmware, uh, system architecture, and uh, system designs. And we are hiring, um, just a side note, uh, to expand our team. And if anyone of you are interested to join the kernel team at Qualcomm, do send an email to my uh, email ID, which is in the intro slide, and, uh, or we can talk in, the, you know, in, uh, in this event. So something about the paging in it. Um, so paging in it is uh, like a foundation of the memory management uh, in the kernel. So when the kernel boots up, uh, it's going to call the paging in it. Uh, basically, it sets up the page tables for the entire uh, RAM or the DDR. Uh, and uh, it, it's part of the start kernel routine uh, You know when, you're, when your kernel is uh, starting up. Uh, but the interesting thing is uh, all this initialization of the memory, uh, it's all done in the boot CPU. Uh, using uh, in, in a very in a, in a single thread fashion, uh, this happens even if you have an SMP system, like if you have multiple cores. But the whole boot procedure happens in the boot CPUs, and most of the time, in a, in a big little or clustered uh, CPU architecture, you, uh, you know most of the this boot CPU is usually the little one. So uh, all of these things happens in a, in a in a boot CPU in a single CPU in a, in a single thread fashion. And if you have machines with larger RAMs, like say few terabytes of GB uh, and a terabytes of memory, it's going to take much more time to boot up the system until user space is up. Uh, these are other uh, functions as well that's kind of dependent on the size of the uh, like the RAM. Uh, so the boot mem minute, uh, this initializes something called the mem map data or the something called the page struct. Uh, so every page in the memory is being pointed by something called a page struct. Uh, so this boot mem unit is, is responsible for doing, uh, you know, mem block in it and everything. Uh, and also is responsible for doing sparse mem in it. Uh, so basically initializes all the sections uh, in the RAM uh, and then populates the vmem map data for the sections. And we have the mm in it. Uh, it, it. It does a bunch of things like, um, you know, uh, basically initializes all the memory allocators in the system. Uh, like stack depot, uh, cache mem in it, uh, kmem leak uh, initialization, uh, vmalloc in it, and then mm cache in it. Uh, but the, the one that we are interested in is uh, mem in it, uh, which the execution time depends on the size of the RAM. Uh, basically, uh, it gives all the pages that is free after the boot uh, to the body allocator or the system allocator uh, as part of the free list. So the execution time kind of depends on your size of the RAM. Um, this is like a, uh, like a flow chart uh, visual representation. So you have this start kernel here. And, uh, and as part of the setup arch, you have the mem block in it, paging in it, and then the boot mem in it. And then outside the setup arch, you have the mm, mm, uh, mm, mm in it. So all of these things, the execution time of these four blocks over here, they're all dependent on the size of the, uh, the DDR that you have. So larger the DDR, more initialization work has to be done, more the time. So for here, for example, for a 12 GB DDR, uh, in all of these four functions, we'll be doing uh, memory initialization for the, for the entire 12 GB RAM. And these are all done in a single threaded uh, uh, fashion using the boot CPU. So the whole idea is, uh, wh why not we do some of the initialization of the memory in a deferred fashion, like sometime later? Uh, so the general motivation is that, you know, we will, uh, we can reduce the boot up time by putting up the system with, uh, a very subset or, 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 or a minimal amount of memory, just sufficient to initialize the kernel and initialize the user space. And then the rest of the memory can be initialized sometime later. Because when you're booting up the kernel, 
you don't need the entire 12 GB or you know you know X GB of memory to be present. So you can just uh, initialize a subset of the memory uh, during kernel boot, and then the rest of the memory can be initialized in a deferred fashion uh, sometime later. Um, so that's the whole idea here. Uh, and then you know once the kernel init is done, and once the SME is uh, up, like once you have the secondary CPUs up. Uh, we will parallelize initializing of the other remaining blocks you know, in, a, in a parallel fashion. So this is actually originally inspired by something called a deferred uh, struct page in it. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's been there in the, in, the, in the previous five kernel generations, but it's mainly for servers. Uh, we have, which has TBs of uh, you know, uh, system RAM. Um, so initialization of the C, um, remaining memory is done uh, using kthreads. Uh, uh, that's what the deferred struct page in it does in, in a deferred fashion. And it uses something called you know, like deferred probe mechanism, uh, where once all the drivers are, are up, uh, and then you know, this feature kicks in. And then as part of the deferred probe, it initializes all the rest of the remaining memory. Uh, possible impact is, uh, you know, are the, since we are initializing at the end of the kernel, it, it might impact some of your other functions, which will be running at the end of the kernel. Uh, so there'll be a minimal performance impact. Uh, but what we observed is very minimum that it's, uh, you know, it's part of the noise. And uh, this overall saves several milliseconds, uh, you know, depend, depending on how much GB of memory you're trying to do in a deferred fashion. So that'll save you uh, several milliseconds uh, of your boot time. And I'll explain more about how much, uh, what are the KPI numbers for this. So this is a visual representation. Um, so for example, if you have a 12 GB DDR, uh, the first two to two, three GB, which is sufficient to initialize the kernel or to initialize the user space, uh, you know, I, I do it using the boot mem in it. Uh, basically I say that, hey kernel, you know, you have only two GB or three GB, just initialize with this memory. And then the rest uh, nine or 10 GB, I do it in a deferred fashion. Uh, this can be done by kthreads, uh, where the kernel takes care uh, of the responsibility of doing the uh, you know, deferred initialization. Or you can use uh, user space, uh, where you have flexibility to uh, you know, add few memory to a different uh, particular nodes and then zones, memory zones in the system. And also gives you the flexibility to uh, you know, uh, add X amount of memory to this zone and the X amount, you know, Y amount of memory to other zones. Um, so yeah, the general idea is boot up with just minimum RAM over here and then the rest of the memory you add it later on. Uh, so from the device boots, kernel it's with this 2GB. Uh, and then once the Android in it, or basically your user space in it is done, uh, you use a new user space entity to add the re remaining memory in a deferred fashion. Uh, and that of course comes to the kernel. Uh, and then basically kernel is the one who does, does uh, you know, uh, basically uses the memory hot plug to do, to hot plug in uh, the remaining blocks. And I explain more about what uh, memory hot plug and how we use memory hot plug to add add memory to the system. Um, this is also a, a visual represent, uh, representation here. So on the left side is the, the normal case uh, where you boot the system, for example, with a 12 GB RAM, uh, you boot the system with the entire 12 GB. Everything is done in the, in the boot CPU here. And this is the time. Uh, and I've also scaled the excesses with uh, the CPU horsepower, meaning you know, how, how powerful uh, the CPU is. So if you see here for the entire RAM, you know, it takes, uh, it's all done in a single CPU here uh, in the left side. Uh, but if you see on the right side, when we do it using the deferred memory initialization fashion, uh, we initialize only uh, uh, a subset of the memory, which is shown in the gray uh, bar over here. And then once uh, SMP in it uh, is done, once the kernel in it is done, and once the SMP is up, then I have access to other CPUs and other bigger CPUs. Uh, and then I'll, I'll try to schedule uh, initializing of this memory to different CPUs uh, in a parallel fashion. So for example, your CPU1 and CPU2 will be initializing different memory zones and they're all doing it in, in, a, in a parallel fashion. And then once, uh, you know, based on, you know, scheduler, scheduler and everything, once I have CPU3 available and which is a much fatter or bigger CPU, uh, that will be doing initializing for the other remaining CPU, uh, memory and then that will complete much faster than uh, the, the, the left side, which is, uh, you know, one single bar over here. So basically, you'll have a boot time saving of, uh, you know, you'll have some significant memory savings uh, compared to the, the whole single C, uh, boot CPU, uh, you know, mechanism over here. 
So adding memory to required zones. Um, so the kernel kind of divides, uh, you know, your system RAM into different memory zones. Um, you know, something called normal zone, uh, mobile zone, uh, DMA zone. Uh, so the normal zone is the one that allocates memory for your DMA allocations, which is, which are considered to be non-movable, uh, where the pages are pinned over there. So you'll have a system where, you know, it might have a different spectrum of, uh, you know, memory zones in the RAM. Like you'll have some normal zone for my DMA allocations, some mobile zone for like mobile applications, and then some DMA zone for like for DMA applications, uh, for, you know, for, for the hardware that supports 32-bit uh, DMA. So in order to do that, uh, I, you know, the kernel threads, they will not have knowledge about these uh, configurations, like how much memory should be there for a mobile zone and normal zone and et cetera. So instead of doing it in the kernel, uh, we try to do it in the user space, which I explained before, uh, where the user space will have knowledge about how much memory should be there uh, in each of the zones, and it will try to use a memory hot plug to add memory to the required zone. Um, so we, this whole feature uses a memory hot plug. You know, uh, it's basically like DIMMs for you know your laptops and PCs, uh, where uh, and if you want to add extra RAM, you just plug in the the slot, and then you know the the the, the extra memory has been added to the system. So it's kind of hot plugged in. Uh, so we use memory hot plug to kind of initialize the remaining memory. And the user space can do something like uh, echo address uh, to the probe. So it can say that, uh, you know, at this address, add this, uh, this particular memory. And uh, the, the, the size of the memory is fixed, it's something called the, the block size. They are usually considered to be 128 megabytes uh, for ARM64 uh, systems. And then once you add that memory, you can do something called online mobile or online kernel. So online mobile means uh, you know you initialize this memory block that just got added into the mobile zone, and then online kernel means you initialize this memory block that hot added into the normal zone. Uh, so in this way, user space can have uh, you know flexibility to add uh, memory to the required zones uh, that's needed, and we use memory hot plug uh, over here, and that's why we can prefer user space approach compared compared to the kernel approach. So limiting the boot memory, um, there's, there should be a way to kind of limit, uh, you know, the whole, for example, the 2GB where we, I want the system to initialize just for the subset uh, of memory uh, sufficient to initialize the kernel and the user space. So there should be a way to let the kernel know that, you know, if, even if you have 12GB of RAM, just initialize with just 2GB or 3GB of RAM. So we use something called as the mem equal to uh, command line parameter. Uh, so what it does is, uh, uh, you know, in the command line parameter, if you set, uh, you know, mem equal to 2GB, for example, uh, it's going to boot up the system with just 2GB, uh, and then it'll, the, the kernel or the system will know that it only has 2GB, even though it has physical 12GB RAM. So now we have 2GB, the kernel is initialized 2GB. Now how do, we, how do I know, or how does the kernel or the user space know what is the, the remaining end of the RAM, you know? So in a 12GB system, 2GB is initialized, 10 GB is the remaining, so how do I know how much that 10 GB is? So in the DT, if you know, we have this node called uh, memory node, uh, which is usually initialized by the bootloader, depending on the DDR size that has been attached. Uh, so it will actually populate this reg property in the memory node, uh, which will say what is the size, or basically it's a RAM partition table. Uh, it will say what is the size of the, uh, you know, size of the partition, start, of, start address of the partition. So for simplicity over here, there's only one single entry in the rec, which says uh, at the zero address, you have, um, you know, 12 GB of memory here. So in my kernel code or, you know, in my kernel driver, I, I, I use this, I scan this uh, memory node and then get the uh, rec property and then know what's the size of the RAM that is been attached. And then there's something called boot mem, uh, mem, mem block address, which will say, what is the end address that the kernel had booted up with, with this 2 GB? And uh, you know, I know that uh, the, the boot from DRAM end address is uh, 12 GB, so I know that difference is 10 GB now. And then this 10 GB has to be added in a different fashion. And the kernel can kick in k-threads, or user space can do uh, adding the, the memory of the, this 10 GB in, in, in a parallel fashion. So yeah, the rest of the memory can be initialized in async fashion, uh, gives flexibility to add memory to the required zones and the required nodes. So we, have, we use mem equal to parameter to kind of limit the kernel boot, and then we add the remaining memory later on. So what are the ways to 
do deferred memory uh, initialization here. Uh, one of them is the kernel driver method, which I explained before. Uh, so you limit the memory using the mem equal to parameter, and then you do use the memory hot plug uh, function here called memory add memory driver managed. Uh, what this basically does is uh, it adds memory using memory hot plug, but it's kind of driver managed. It's not a boot mem managed. Uh, so we use mem you know add memory driver managed with the particular size. So uh, with this function, it will add this particular size using the memory hot plug. And we have this kernel, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, command line parameters here, uh, you know, to, to say what are the state, you know, if I add this memory, so there's a mem hot plug default state equal to online. What this means is if I add this, mem uh, you know, memory, it will be initialized automatically. Uh, so you don't have, the, the kernel doesn't have to do, you know, add pages or online pages or, you know, by itself. So, if you have this command line uh, parameter, it will be initialized automatically. And then movable node or something also called kernel node, this will specify what uh, uh, what memory zone to be added uh, by default. Uh, so if you have combination of these two, uh, you know, default state is equal to online and then movable node. So what this means is if I do add memory driver managed 128 MB, it will be initialized by default and will be added to the mobile zone by default. So this way, you know, I can uh, add uh, extra memory in a deferred fashion to a particular zone. But the limitation here is, uh, you know, we can only add memory to a to a required memory zone, and this cannot be changed runtime. So, for example, in a deferred fashion, if you see over here, uh, in this 10 GB, if I want to add uh, 5 GB in the mobile zone, and then the the rest 5 GB in the normal uh, in the in the normal zone, that's not possible. You can only add, uh, you know, this 10 GB in only required memory, either mobile zone or normal zone. So that flexibility is not there in the using the kernel method. So to overcome this, we use uh, the user space method, uh, where uh, still the kernel, you know, reads through the DT nodes, gets to know the mem equal to uh, value, uh, how much the memory has been, how much the kernel is initialized with, and how much is the remaining memory. And then those information has been fed into the user space via the CSFS nodes. Basically, the mem block end of DRAM, uh, and uh, that's basically your 2 GB memory here. And the boot mem end of DRAM, that's the end of your 12 GB here. And then how much memory should be added to the kernel, kernel zone, and then how much memory uh, added to the mobile zone, that is the kernel core and the mobile core. So this way, you know, you know, uh, uh, the user space will have flexibility to add required, you know, the memory to the required zones, uh, which was not there in the kernel zone, uh, in the kernel method. But here, you know, since it's, it's we have to do it in the user space, uh, you know, we have to wait until the user space is done initializing. So there'll be a bit of a delay where your entire RAM has been initialized. So here's one example. Uh, so boot mem size equal to two GB, where if I have mem equal to two GB, so the system initializes it with two GB during boot. But my DRAM size is 12 GB, where I have a 12 GB DDR attached to the system. And then in one of these DT property, I have mobile core equal to 5 GB. Uh, says, you know, I, I need 5 GB of mobile zone. So the remaining memory is, uh, you know, 12 minus uh, 5, 12 minus 2 minus 5, which is 5, 5. This will be considered to be put in the, in the normal zone, which is the kernel core memory. So your RAM will be something like this, where the first 2 GB will be added by the, the, by the boot, during boot. Uh, and then the next 5 GB will be added by the user space using memory hot plug uh, and to be added to the kernel core, basically this 5GB in the normal zone. And then the next 5GB will be hot plugged in into the mobile zone using the mobile core. Uh, so this way we will have flexibility to add uh, you know, memory to different zones using memory hot plug. So boot time reduction, um, we have implemented this feature uh, as, as part of a different uh, uh, mechanism uh, in, in SM8550 uh, with 12 GB of RAM. Uh, and then with experimentations, we have seen that uh, we get, you know, uh, by limiting with just 2 GB during boot, uh, we see that we get about 160 to 200 milliseconds uh, in a boot KPS savings. So this is roughly, uh, this boot KPS savings by, you know, adding 8 GB in a deferred fashion. Uh, and uh, so this is roughly like 20 to 30 millisecond of uh, boot time reduction per GB. So if you have a system with much larger RAM, uh, you know, 12 or 16 or 24, 
you just boot up with 2 GB and the rest of the RAM can be initialized in different fashion and then you will have uh, a considerable amount of uh, you know, boot saving. So here 200 milliseconds is one fifth of your second. Uh, you know, according to our performance team, you know, even if you have one millisecond of boot time savings, it's a, you know, it's a plus. And we get this without any, any loss, like there's no, uh, there's no drawbacks, uh, you know, there's no performance impact. Uh, and there's there's no uh, you know there's no process or or, or tasks that actually need your entire 12 GB during boot, so uh, it kind of makes sense to just boot up the system sufficient to initialize kernel and the user space, and then the rest of the memory can be initialized uh, in deferred fashion later on. So this is absorbed by uh, profiling paging in it, and then the boot init. We do have some uh, scripts that we run uh, uh, that captures the overall boot KPIs from the bootloader till the kernel in it to, uh, to the kernel modules in it to the native daemons and then to the user space in it to the HAL in it. So we do see that uh, you know, the kernel load uh, and the, uh, the kernel module load times, those, those are all reduced uh, using this feature. But there's a bit of a catch there. Um, which I'll explain. Uh, uh, it's that the paging in it, the, the boot mem in it, and the mm in it. Uh, these functions are the ones which will actually shrink uh, if you have, if you initialize with the you know lesser RAM, uh, lesser memory initially. But the, the but the catch here is uh, you know uh, these functions are are, are are done before the time in it has been done. So basically, your kernel time will not be available. Uh, you know before. Uh, uh, you know, or your kernel time will not be available after your paging in it, boot memory in it, and MMM. So there's no way to kind of, uh, or there's no way to rely on the kernel time to capture this boot KPI numbers. So we have to do something different. So we have to use some uh, some other hardware timestamps or clocks uh, to kind of brute force a way of uh, getting the counter values and then you know determine how much time it uh, took from kernel start till you know uh, the uh, till the end of the kernel in it. So we had to use some of the hardware clocks or timestamps that we have in our hardware, uh, and then you know that's because we couldn't rely on on the kernel time because the kernel unit is not available yet. Um, so the challenges uh, over here it requires memory hot plug support to be enabled. Um, so the memory hot plug support is present in ARM64. Uh, it's, it's obviously there in x86 uh, architecture as well. Uh, so it needs, uh, you know, memory hotlock to be enabled, and uh, so so the full parallelism. Though we say that we we can initialize the rest of the RAM in a deferred fashion, uh, it's not that mostly you achieve 100% parallelism. That's because of the zone lock. Uh, so what this means is, uh, you know, if you have, for example, 5 GB of memory to be added to the normal zone, you cannot split the 5 GB into 1 GB, 1 GB each, and then give it to a different CPUs in the different threads, and then try to achieve parallelism because of the zone lock. Uh, you know, if you're trying to add memory to, to, to a particular zone, it'll actually take a zone lock. So other threads that are trying to act, uh, add memory to the same zone, that will be waiting uh, until the zone lock has been released. But if you're trying to add memory to a different uh, zone and in a different node, that, that time you can achieve uh, you know, parallelism. For example, one of the CPU can add memory to the mobile zone another CPU can be adding memory to the normal zone, and then th those, those two can happen in parallel. But you cannot achieve 100% parallelism because of the zone lock. Uh, so there's a uh, there's bit of a, you know, uh, kind of leverage being taken out over here. So determining the initial size that you want to boot up the kernel with, uh, that is sufficient to boot up your kernel or your user space, uh, this is uh, this is also a challenge. Uh, you know, I've been saying 2 GB for your 12 GB RAM. Uh, we have seen that you know for more uh, you know more mature Android versions or for OEM versions, uh, 2 GB is not sufficient. You know, they usually require 4 GB or 5 GB to boot up uh, Android. Uh, and then it's very hard to determine. Uh, you know, for each uh, you know generations of a chipset or system, it's hard to determine what is the fixed uh, value for this. So there has to be some bit of a work to be done to budget the memory and to know how much memory is sufficient uh, and how much memory we should limit uh, during boot. And as I explained, like capturing the boot time is hard uh, because the kernel time is not initialized yet uh, after the paging in it and then the uh, you know the boot memory and other ones. So we had to rely on other hardware counters that's available in the system to capture the boot KPI. 
Um, so we have to have robust code and error handling. Uh, this is because uh, you know we boot the system with limited memory, and then your deferred memory code or feature breaks, and there's no one to initialize the, the rest of the 10 GB memory. So your system is now stuck with 2 GB forever, and uh, you know it's uh, uh, that's a, that's a big bummer. So we have to make sure that you know there's proper error handling done where. Kernel, since kernel takes majority of the responsibility here, uh, it, it checks if, uh, you know, is, is the rest of the system, is, is the rest of the memory has been added to the system or not? Is it has been, uh, you know, added by the user space or not? If not, then the kernel kind of takes over and then it adds the rest of the memory using whichever method it's available. So we have to make sure that the error handling or the code itself, the features has to be robust so that once you boot up a user space, whatever memory that's been there to the system has been initialized. And this might interfere with performance of the task that is early, uh, running early, uh, you know, during boot. Uh, uh, but this, we did do some measurements, uh, and we did not see any impacts uh, in any of the tasks that are running once the user space is up. Uh, it might be, it, it's very small that it's uh, hidden inside the, in the noise in the, in the standard deviation. So um, this feature isn't uh, upstreamed yet. Uh, there has been a lot of uh, discussion internally in our company or in our team about what is the exact uh, uh, you know, uh, savings that, that we have. Uh, and there's been a lot of discussions about you know, is there actual parallelism being achieved? Is there actual uh, you know, boot KPI being you know, uh, reduced? Uh, and then after a lot of conclusions and experiments, we did find that, you know, and using the hardware counters, uh, hardware uh, timer and, and counters to do the measurements, we, we conclude that there is a bit of a savings because there will be some parallelism ach achieved if you're onlining, if you're adding memory in a deferred fashion later on. So we haven't upstreamed the feature yet, but uh, right now we will be upstreaming it. Uh, we, will, we will be upstreaming it further. Uh, and then uh, so we'll be using actually upstreaming the kernel method uh, because, you know, if you upstream a, uh, in this feature and then let the developers or the OEMs to implement their own user space method, then it becomes, a, you know, it's, it's not an end-to-end -end solution. Uh, and then we have to rely on the, you know, how the developers would implement the user space. So we'll actually upstream the kernel method uh, by fixing the limitation that I mentioned, uh, where the kernel will now will have a uh, way to add memory to a, to a, a particular zone. So something like uh, add memory zone, uh, which is not present, but you know, we'll be thinking of sending it as an RFC to the, to the community, where the, kernel, where the kernel can add memory to a required zone, uh, and the kernel will have the flexibility uh, that the user space has, actually. So this has its own uh, limitations, where you have to make sure that uh, you know, the zones are, uh, are not discontinuous. Uh, for example, you know, you, you have 3 GB of normal zone, and then you have 2 GB of mobile zone, and then you cannot have another normal zone. So it has to be fixed, uh, you know, first 6 GB or X GB has to be normal zone, and then the rest have to be mobile zone. So you cannot have, you know, mixed uh, uh, memory zone in the system. So those things we have to make sure uh, that, uh, you know, such calls are not honored, and we have to do all, put all those checks and limitations in this whatever API that we're going to implement. Uh, so it has its own limitations, and it might, and, and, and let's see what uh, the upstream community has to comment on this. Uh, but yeah, so it'll be implemented as kernel driver where a combination of uh, these three uh, command line parameters, the mem equal to one uh, used to limit the memory during boot, and then the deferred mem, uh, you know, kernel core as part of the percentage, because you cannot put numbers over here, like uh, you know 5 GB or X GB, because you know you don't know what uh, you know DDR, what what's the size of the RAM that will be attached uh, to the system. So we'll put something like uh, percentage-wise. So for example, for 12 GB DDR, uh, we'll have mem equal to 2 GB to limit the the memory uh, during boot, and then the mobile core is equal to 40 percent. Uh, so what this means is 40 uh, percent of your 12 GB will be for, uh, you know, uh, of course, run it off to, uh, you know, the mem block size or 1 GB here. So 40% of 12 GB will be added to the mobile zone, which is 5, and then the rest of the memory will be added, which is 5 GB again, uh, will be added to the normal zone here. 
So this way, uh, you know, without relying on any user space implementation, uh, we'll have like a separate kernel driver. And this can be, of course, uh, enabled or disabled using maybe a config or maybe a command line parameter again, where if you have enabled it, and if you have all these three parameters, you'll be able to achieve some boot time savings by initializing some, you know, uh, some part of the memory in a deferred fashion. So I'll keep the, the next uh, few minutes for questions. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering uh, if this can somehow help to reduce power consumption by, uh, may, maybe it needs to interact with the DRAM controller, but uh, until the point we may actually want to have more memory, maybe we could turn off the, some DRAM modules and uh, could get uh, the reduced power consumption. And the, the, my second question is, uh, so you mentioned that there might be some performance impact for the applications, uh, but uh, I wonder that if the current implementation already extends the, the maybe page fault pass or body allocator, uh, so that when the application requires a huge amount of memory, when the, the physical memory still, is still not initialized, uh, I, I, I assume that um, my Linux kernel would perform um killer and uh, start yeah. getting care, killing the processes. Uh, but yeah, it's not performance impact. I think it's much worse than performance impact. So uh, I, I wonder how you actually handle when the user space uh, tries to allocate more memory when the enough amount of memory is not available. Okay, yeah. So for the first point about the the way of uh, turning off some memory for uh, initially for power consumption, is that is that the question? Right? So yeah, we we did uh, uh, we did implement that feature. Uh, it's something called as uh, PASR partially self refresh. Uh, and then uh, I myself did uh, in a present this in the LPC last year, uh, where you know for example you have this 12 GB uh, RAM, RAM over here. Uh, you won't need the entire 12 GB RAM. You know, for lightweight uh, usage of the system. Uh, so in that way, you know, you know, you can turn off, let's say, 5 GB of RAM uh, during lightweight usage of the system. And you can use this technology called PASR, partial array self-refresh, to turn off the memory, turn off the self-refresh currents, and then save power. Uh, so we do have implemented that. And uh, I have implemented, I've presented this as in LPC last year. Uh, but another note to the power, uh, power savings or the power consumption uh, is that during deferred memory initialization, we do try to use the bigger CPUs, which will consume more power. And according to our performance team or power team, we don't care about power consumption during boot. You know, as long as uh, you know, as long as we can boot the system much faster by taking more power, uh, you know, we will of course try to. Uh, gauge that and then you know go with uh, more performance number rather than power. But yeah, we do initialize it. So the kernel driver does add memory fine to the higher horsepower CPUs, and we don't care about the power. And for the second one, uh, the in the user space side, you know, we will try to make sure that the memory is initialized much much before your actual processes are being initialized. Uh, so this is much before. I would say the uh, very early part of the user space in it, uh, maybe sometime HAL, uh, before you let other third-party applications to run uh, so that you don't kick into OM killer uh, or OOM killer or the LMKD in the Android. So this is way early in the user space in it where we initialize the memory and then, so if you see here the HAL in it, HAL client in it. So as part of the Android core and then HAL in it, uh, we will initialize it, we will initialize all the memory in this, uh, you know, uh, in this phase. And then once this completed, all the memory is initialized, and then we'll, all the other HAL clients will be initialized. So 
So this will make sure that we will add all the memory uh, much before your other user space applications have been done. Thank you very much. Tuning stuff seems difficult and scary to me. And uh, so, like, anytime I have to come up with knobs and. Oh, sorry. The tuning stuff seems difficult and scary, and maybe I'm ignorant, but anytime I see knobs, I don't want to. I don't want to have to come up with knobs and maintain those across kernel versions and boards and stuff. I, I kind of want it so that I can turn on a flag that says, make it boot faster, but just boot as if this flag wasn't there, right? So like okay. the percentage between movable and normal and DMA memory, it should just, without me telling it, it should just do the same thing as it would as if I booted without this flag, but okay. just boot faster. And yeah. so, like, in order to feel like I could use this and maintain it, that's what I really want. Yep, yeah. yeah, I mean, I totally agree. I mean, uh, you know, uh, this whole part of tuning and everything, it's, it's, uh, it's a time cumbersome thing and uh, it's scary as well. And, uh, and every time we have a new chipset or a new system, we have to determine, we have to do this memory budgeting, do this whole math, and then do the percentage wise. It would be cleaner if uh, the kernel somehow gets to know this automatically and then figures out how much memory is needed for the boot and how much memory can be initialized later on. And if uh, if there's a mechanism where the kernel can do it, uh, kernel can determine it by itself, where the user doesn't have to depend on rely or doesn't even have to know the knowledge of all these things. Just by enabling a flag, the kernel will decide by itself how much memory should be for boot in it and how much memory should be for deferred in it and the kernel should do it by itself. That would be great. Couldn't it like register fault handlers and, and if it notices that someone tries to access too much, it, it starts initializing then or something? So something like demand paging. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's one, one idea that it can be implemented. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this, uh, yeah, we have been doing it manually for, or at least it's part of a different future actually. So. Uh, to say, you know, we're not doing all this, uh, you know, percentage-wise, but we do set aside like mobile zone, uh, especially for this memory offlining feature, the, the power saving feature that I, that I was mentioned. Uh, but yeah, we are working on this, and once we have a solution, or maybe we can ask the community for comments as well, uh, where you know uh, we can have this feature enable, and the admin or the user doesn't have to worry about all this tuning and stuff, and the kernel can do it by itself. Something like demand paging. Yeah. All right, thank you.